Oh. Good evening. Um, <laughs> it's November 4th, 2014, and we're here for the Brattleboro Select Board meeting. We called the meeting to order at 5.30 uh, and went into executive session. Uh, we rose from executive session uh, without uh, making any decisions in uh, that executive session. Uh, the first item on the agenda in this new meeting space here today, which is sort of disorienting, <laughs> is to approve the minutes from October 17, October 20, October 21, and October 23. Do we have a motion to approve those minutes? So moved. So moved. All we of have, them. We have a motion to approve the minutes from October 17, 20, 21, and 23. Is there any discussion from anybody on the board? From anybody who's in attendance? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Anybody opposed or abstaining? That carries. 5-0. Um, the next matter on the agenda is Chair's remarks. Um, I would just note, if anybody's watching on TV, that it uh, continues to be Election Day and the polls are open here in Bradbury until 7 o'clock. We encourage everybody to come out and vote. Um, other than that, I've got no Chair's remarks at this point. The next item on the agenda is the uh, Town Manager's comments. No comment this evening. Uh, next item on the agenda is select board comments and committee reports. Anybody on the board? We're good at this end. Anybody down here? Um, yeah, the waste uh, management district is looking at their budget for the year and um, got a couple of proposals for single stream recycling and the comparing the, the real cost because there are costs beyond what the, the bid is um, based on the, the what the, the particulars of the two bids looking for real cost compared to the cost of retaining the current dual stream in the facility. So the choice is whether to go to single stream and become a transfer <laughs> facility and maybe use the, the uh, recycling center as a compost uh, center um, or try staying with, with all the uncertainties in the next year or so, uh, possibly staying with the dual stream and seeing what happens over time. And the, the costs are, are very similar. There's not, in fact, there's actually an expense going to um, the single stream under the current proposals. Thank you. Anybody else? I would note that uh, um, I noted in the front of the newspaper today that there was a reference to the Western Avenue uh, scoping study having been quote unquote approved. Uh, I was at the Traffic Safety Committee meeting last Tuesday, and that plan was not uh, quote-unquote approved. Uh, it was discussed. Some real concerns were expressed about some of the um, plans that were uh, discussed in uh, that study, and that's going to be on the select board agenda two weeks from tonight. And so we'll hear about that in more detail uh, two weeks from now. Anybody else? Uh, the next item on the agenda is public comment. <laughs> the next item on the agenda is public participation. So if anybody wants to speak to an item that is not on the agenda, um, this would be a good time to do so. Please make sure to use the microphone and identify yourself. Okay. Thank you. Good evening, Chair. Uh, my name is Holland Mills. Uh, I've lived at 53 Elliott Street, apartment 9, in downtown Brattleboro uh, since the 1st of September 2007. We have been having an ongoing problem with our neighbor, uh, Metropolis, at 55 Elliott Street. Particularly on Thursday nights, they have what they call funk night. They have done a serious remodel. They are no longer a cocktail lounge. Uh, there is uh, a joke that goes around town that they are Artropolis, essentially. They are a version of Arkham that's now over in Metropolis. They are extremely loud at times, especially on Thursday nights, but oftentimes more than once a week. Thankfully, they are closed Sunday through Tuesdays, and we can get some rest. After 10 p.m. on a Thursday night, you can be sure at latest by 1040 that a band starts up the bass becomes extremely loud i live over towards harmony lot and two floors up with my windows closed i can hear the bass booming off uh, the emerson building right at my windows to the point that i have to turn up volume 
uh, just to listen to um, uh, uh, whatever I'm watching on TV or some music or so forth. Um, the law enforcement response to this has been insufficient, in my opinion, and there seems to be some uh, lack of respect for what the uh, what the noise ordinance says. So I've brought some of the noise ordinance. If you would grant me a little time to recite some of them. Uh, Section 13107, any law enforcement may issue a municipal complaint ticket for offenses of the noise control ordinance. They don't need me to come down after I complain about the noise to further complain about the noise and ask me questions that are basically irrelevant. You can uh, feel the walls shaking at one point on the 24th of July and another time shortly after that they were so loud that the concrete was shaking on the floor on the stoop that we share as well as the concrete on Elliott Street the operative word in the noise control ordinance is unreasonable this is far beyond unreasonable the enforcements and penalties that are talked about go up to $500. It starts at $25 and $50, uh, sorry, $50 for the first offense, $100 for the second, $250 for each subsequent offense within the six month period, and then it hits $500. I don't believe a ticket has ever been written. I have called numerous times, uh, certainly since. Uh, the aforementioned, I believe it's the 24th of July, it was the Thursday, um, and so forth. Uh, the express prohibitions, uh, which are in place to uh, reduce unnecessary noises, which are uh, detrimental to the enjoyment of life, to excerpt it. The following acts are declared too loud. The operating of a musical instrument and so forth, they can't control the bass at all. Oftentimes I can hear the drums. Sometimes I'll, I'll hear a muffled sax or a muffled vocals. Um, and this will go on hours if people don't intervene. And the kind of intervention, if I'm not called down, will just be a talking to. The Saturday before last, the talking to resulted in, once the law enforcement officer left, they turned it up even louder than when I originally lodged my complaint shortly after 10 p.m. Um, uh, the sound in such a matter as to be plainly audible through walls between units in the same building from another property or from the street between the hours of 10 p.m. and 7 a.m. or in a manner to as unreasonably disturb the peace, quiet, or comfort of the public. This is being done at a transcendental level. It is extraordinarily loud when they start up. I don't know why they were quiet as a dormouse last Saturday. On Friday, they were a dull roar, but they were still clearly uh, violating the ordinance. On the 28th, um, I called in about it. They kind of turned it down and they turned it off finally about midnight. And I was just too darn tired on the 23rd of October to call it in. And that's a problem I have trying to galvanize my neighbors. They're a tired bunch. They're a working bunch. This is not fun for me, and it's not fun for them. I have the time. I feel it's my civic responsibility to bring this to the fore. This cannot continue with Metropolis. They are not the same institution that they were at the beginning of March of this year. Um, they are the same proprietors as the ones at Arkham, and maybe at some point some of my neighbors who are disturbed by Arkham will come forward, but for now, all I can speak to is the actions of Metropolis. They were a fine neighbor before the renovations that occurred in March of this year. They are no longer a fine neighbor. They are an enormously rowdy one. One that one time a guest came to my apartment, I have to go downstairs to pick him up, he got a headache just simply walking the street and coming up to my apartment. Um, I would really like, I know that the Bravo Police Department is understaffed at this time and that some quality of life issues um, uh, have to take a back seat, so sometimes I wait an hour for someone to come. But there's no necessity to bring me down there. It's quite obvious what's going on that this is way out of control and it really needs to be stopped as soon as possible, preferably not even happen on this Thursday.
Thank you, Ms. Mills. Thank you. Um, hopefully the uh, police department and the uh, town manager can look into this and give us whatever information they might have uh, in anticipation of the next time we meet. Um, anybody else want to uh, speak in public participation? All right, so the next item on the agenda is uh, liquor commissioners. We're looking for a motion, please, to convene as liquor commissioners. So moved. We have a motion to convene as liquor commissioners. Is there any discussion? Hearing none. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed or abstaining? That carries 5 0. Um, we have an application from. Um, Mr. Luristus. Is Mr. Luristus here? Hey, do you want to come up to the microphone? I remember what he called me. The microphone is only for the television. Okay. It's not for <laughs> amplification in the room. But this is a good chance for you to speak a little bit about your business because you're getting some free television time. <laughs> Thank you. And tell us what you're applying for, too. I'm a little, uh, actually, a lot sick tonight. So oh. I hope you feel better. Oh, good. Small room. <laughs> <laughs> um, I uh, just uh, purchased my father's uh, business on Canal Street, uh, George Loristus. It was called Giorgio's Pizza and Pasta. Uh, we're changing the name to House of Pizza, and I'm just applying for a liquor license. So for beer and wine, of course. Excellent. Um, Patrick, the things that we need to uh, be aware of, uh, taxes are paid, <laughs> and um, yeah. yep. anything else? Go ahead. Nope. Uh, all taxes, and, and there are no outstanding fees or taxes. And the application has been reviewed and considered by both the fire department and police department and both uh, um, I think it's a good move to move forward. Any questions or comments from the board? No, Giorgio's, they've always had a liquor license, right? Beer and wine? Yes. That's, yeah, that's what I thought. Anybody in attendance want to speak to this application? Well, um, if not, then we're ready for motion. Where is it? <laughs> to approve a first-class liquor license for Demetrius Laristus. Laristus, thank you. For Canal Street House of Pizza, Inc. at 419 Canal Street. Mm -hmm. We have a motion to approve the first-class liquor license. Is there any further discussion? Mm -hmm. Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Anybody opposed or abstaining? That carries 5-0. Good luck to you. Thank you. Feel better. All set. Yeah. All set. You're all set. <laughs> See you. Okay. All right. I guess we're ready for a motion to adjourn as liquor commissioners. We have a motion to adjourn as liquor commissioners. Is there any discussion? Carry down all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed for standing? That carries 5 0. Next matter on the agenda is staffing level review for the police department. Um, so we decided at our last select board meeting that we would continue hearing from various department heads about uh, staffing at the various departments, um, not uh, to the exclusion of looking globally at staffing issues, but also to make sure that uh, we have a little bit of detailed knowledge as there's turnover in employees. So, um, I don't know, Chief and Captain, if you want to come up to the table and talk to us a little bit about the hires that we're looking to make the police department use. Sign in, please. <laughs> well, currently, we're staffed uh, to hold 27 we sworn officers, but we are manning uh, 24, so we're, we're three short. We have uh, we're obviously a 24-7, 365 department, and um, we do three shifts, 10 hours apiece, and their minimum staff is three. The academy meets twice a year which is very important to how we uh, employ our resources. They meet in August and in February. And it takes eight months from the time we do interviews to the time an officer can work independently on the, on the road uh, for the police department. So at this point, we, we are currently down three, and we would like to move forward with three. We'll hold uh, oral boards and uh, to get three candidates to send up to the um, February Academy. And we're anticipating a retirement in December. 
But currently, right now, we just have three qualified applicants that we would like to move forward with the board's permission. Chief, how long, how long have we been down three? We and lost two last month. Uh, they, they went to another agency, and we were down one since August. So it's, oh, it's compiling. Oh, okay. Yeah. Because so I thought we were at, I thought we were fully loaded there for a while. We were only down one, but in September we lost two, and then the chief retired, of course, and then we hired one in the academy now, which was the chief replacement, which leaves us a shortage of three. Tell us how much seniority the one the the officers who left had and where they went. And they were why they went. Well, you had the chief, which was the senior yeah. officer uh, at the department. Uh, he retired. Yeah this summer, and then we had two officers that were relatively junior, about three years into it. Uh, they fulfilled their contract. We have them sign a three-year contract. So they uh, fulfilled their contract and moved on to uh, Wyndham County. Sure. So the sheriff's department. Yes, sir. And is the three-year contract the minimum amount of time that you ask officers to sign off on when they're hired? Yes. Okay. And that's for the, the pay, the time, mm -hmm. everything that we put into them, mm -hmm. uh, we think that's a fair and equitable uh, trade-off that they at least do three years on a department before they move on. Okay, so if you're, if you're funded to hire three new officers, they won't actually be up and running until August, is that right? If they go to the academy uh, this <coughs> February. February, it will definitely August, September? Probably August, okay. late August. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, so it oh, takes some time. Oh, it sure does. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It might be short circuited the amount of time that it takes to get an officer up to speed if they're coming with experience from another agency because then they only have to go for a little while to the academy. That is correct. If they're previously certified, that drastically cuts down uh, almost by two thirds of the time. Mm -hmm. But the three applicants we have are not cer certified, so we would have to go through the whole process. So we've already advertised. <clears throat> And yes, we have. We have three people lined up. Yes, sir. Anybody else? Did, yeah, this might have been Go already forward. a question that you might have already answered in a different way. Um, when you do this, do they come in at a junior level, or does every, you know, like, this is like a uh, citizen asking this question kind of thing, or does everybody sort of move up and then you have these positions? You know, is the junior ones, or do they fill positions that through attrition? Or no, you know they all mean? come in at the bottom. Okay. Except for the like, the chief and the captain, you could hire outside, and right. they could enter at that level. But mm -hmm. everybody else uh, below the captain uh, has to work their way up. Okay. Even if they have experience. That is correct. Oh. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Other questions? Is, why do they go to the sheriff's department? <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just, you know, we, we talked in the past, and, I'm, and I appreciate your comment, and I'm actually glad we're doing this now for the, probably the first time we've done a review because I, I just, like, what can we do to have people stay? We spend all this money, we train them, we get them, you know, working with you, and we got, you know, as, as good a conditions as we can have until we get the new, new station, right? And. Um, and then they leave, and you know we got to reinvest and start all over again. That's so just what can we do to keep them um, we'll we'll stay? At the end of the agenda, we have, we have the budget. We can talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> I got a lot of good ideas. So I don't know if they're going to fly, but uh, no, everyone leaves for different reasons, David. You know, uh, personal reasons, of, or yeah. you know, some of them could be for this work schedule, the the hours, or. Or whatever, but they all have their personal reasons. Chief, doesn't that happen a lot though in small, you know, small uh, units? That it does. You know, that we they, got a good turnover. Right. We get a good turnover, and it just happens. Yeah. Let's get that exercise room. Mm -hmm. That'll fix it. He got his budget talking. <laughs> Is there anybody in attendance who wants to speak to this? So the way that we've been proceeding is um, we get information about the uh, uh, positions that are going to be replaced, and we don't really take any action um, other than to say thanks very much for yeah, talking to us about any department functions. Okay. So thanks very much for coming to talk to us about any department functions. And stick around. We will. <laughs> and then the next department we get to hear about is public works. Hi, Hannah. Hi. I had a problem with this one. Not really. So we're here for next 
a staffing level review for a hire at the Department of Public Works. Maybe you could tell us about uh, this position and um, uh, what responsibilities this new hire will be taking on. Uh, good evening. My name is Hannah O'Connell. I'm the Highway and Utilities Superintendent for the Department of Public Works. And we have a position open. It is a highway equipment operator and mechanic four. Uh, this position was created about four years ago when during the budget process, a position was a full-time position in our maintenance department was eliminated. To account for that, we took a highway position and we shifted it to do 49% of their time with the maintenance department and 51% of their time with the highway department. So this is kind of a complicated position. The person has to be experienced in heavy equipment operation and mechanics, diesel mechanics, and also doing all the stuff on the highway side. Um, we have three full-time employees in our maintenance division, a supervisor and two full-time mechanics. And in our highway side, we have 13. We have a supervisor and 12 staff members consisting of truck drivers, laborers, and equipment operators. Um, we did advertise this position in-house in mid-September. We received resumes. We did some practicals um, with the mechanics, and we didn't have anybody that was really fully qualified to take on the mechanical aspect of this position. And so we've now advertised it externally to the general public, and we're looking for some applicants. Could you talk to us just a little bit about the difference between the maintenance division and the highways division? Absolutely. Our maintenance division oversees all of the mechanic uh, work for both the highway and the utilities division. They're in charge of keeping the whole fleet running from small cars to dump trucks to graders and loaders and they'll even respond to some of the mechanical operations either at the wastewater treatment plant or at the water treatment plant if there's something complicated up there. They also do some of the maintenance around the shop, keeping like the HVAC units running, um, furnaces, that kind of thing. They do some of the landscaping around the yard. The highway side is responsible for the day-to-day -day maintenance, snow plowing, all the work during the summer, drainage, bridges, mowing, um, light construction. And so there's a pretty um, wide berth of knowledge for this position to fulfill. And how many vehicles total do we have in utilities and um, public works? About 40. So three mechanics to maintain about 40 days. Correct. Can, do you guys outsource any of the um, the mechanical stuff? And there's, is it if there's something complicated or something very large scale that we don't have the facilities for or the in-depth technical knowledge, then we will. For example, our grader is up at a specialist in Westminster getting a new cab put on. Um, Part of that is that it'd just be such a time-consuming project, we wouldn't be able to work on anything else. We also don't have the like the lifts right, and lift. everything to put that together. Um, I'm just wondering if it's easier to outsource or if it's cheaper in the long run. I don't, I don't know. I'm just asking. I don't have any. Well, it's coming analysis. up later in the meeting, and we can talk. Right. <laughs> that's a. That's a. Uh, comprehensive review of oh, yes. town operations kind of question. I've had people come ask about uh, outsourcing plowing as well. Right. So I know. That needs to be analyzed. Yeah. This would be a very different operational model. Yeah. It certainly would be. Yeah. I just it, just, it just came to me. Great. Other questions from anybody on board? Anybody in attendance have any questions? So uh, we're all set. Thank you very much for coming and talking with us about how your department operates. Um, so the next matter on the agenda is the community development block grant application from the Wyndham Windsor Housing Trust. Um, so I know Connie and your name is Isaac. Isaac. So Connie and Isaac, do you want to come up here? Can I, can I
Can I do my disclaimer before they yeah. start? And before you start the presentation, <laughs> uh, Kate's got something that she wants to disclose. Yeah, I'm actually a member of the State Community Development Board. I was appointed by the governor as a per citizen, not as a select board member, but I've made an agreement with the state that if I participate in, on the select board level, I do not participate on the state level, so there will be no conflict. Okay. Whew. Excellent. If you want right. to say your name while you're here. Um, I'm Connie Snow, and this is Isaac Wagner from the Windham and Windsor Housing Trust. So um, I just want to thank you for considering this sponsorship of a community development block grant for the Housing Trust. Um, these five properties that we wrote to you about have been owned by the Housing Trust for the past um, 20 years, actually one of them closer to 26 years. Um, and at this time, we're wanting to do a round of renovations to the properties, as most especially energy improvements. As you can imagine, controlling energy costs is one of the key ways that we can um, control our overall operating costs and keep the rents affordable on the apartments. So we, we think these properties have provided great housing um, for, for 20 and more years, and we're really focused on um, maintaining these and for the next the next 25 year period so um, really I just wanted to say with your support we'd be able to do that and we're here to answer any questions that you might have maybe you could just speak a little bit since we've had a chance to review the materials uh, but people who are watching and uh, people who are in attendance have not if you could just talk with us a little bit about um, specifically what you're applying for Okay. And the role that the town sponsorship would play in that application. Okay. So um, we're applying for a community development block grant in the amount of 425000 And um, the block grant, um, the applicant needs to be a municipality. So normally these grants are passed through um, the municipality to um, to an eligible entity like, like a non nonprofit or um, for profits as well. Um, so we um, we own these five properties, as I said, and um, and the the funding from the block grant would be used um, towards construction costs um, in this project. And the, the funds originally from the U.S. Department of HUD passed down through the state, to the town, and to the sponsors. And it, it looks like the entire cost of the project is actually much larger than the four hundred twenty-five thousand dollars. Total construction is about two two million. Two point three million yeah. total construction cost. Right. How much of that is is energy upgrades? Ooh, you know the answer to that? I don't know it off the top of my I'm head. Curious how much the you know how much wear and tear has happened to buildings in the twenty years that what's that going to cost compared to and what's? I mean, a good price. chunk of it's energy. But you know, after 20 years, we're doing we're replacing all the finishes, the kitchens, the baths, the vinyl. Um, you know, in some cases, I think some exterior siding, roofs. I mean, it's it's a pretty significant site work. Um, site work. Mm -hmm. So it's a significant renovation, um, um, but a good chunk of the work is energy. Um, and w we look at Isaac can talk more, but. We've, um, we've done all kinds of energy enhancements to or beyond the insulation and weatherization. We've done a lot of solar hot water. We've done some photovoltaics, a, a limited amount, um, occasionally pellet boilers. So we look at, we look at the viability of any, of any of those as we're looking at a renovation. And, and we'll flesh out. We, we have to actually write the application uh, for the December due date. We'll flesh out those costs, you know, uh, between total construction costs and energy features. Uh, no, I, I, have, I have some concerns, um, not about, nothing about this, you know, so that's why I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk to, I, I talked to Jill the other day and uh, I wanna set up a meeting with, with you guys and uh, I just, because I, I still don't understand Wyndham Windsor Housing Trust as much as I should. Um, but because this is stock that you already have, and so is there, is there any administrative cost for us to, to do this? There, um, well, there's a, an ability to get your administrative costs reimbursed through mm -hmm. this grant. 
um, different towns divvy up their administrative costs differently. Certainly there's legal costs for the closing, which could be covered by the grant. Um, and there's oftentimes audit costs, additional audit costs associated with the grant, typical stuff that is covered by the grant. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the things that often towns do is their grant administrator time, the staff time for the grant administrator is provided as sort of in-kind match. It uh, looks good for the CD board. They like to see that town participation. But there are some towns that actually would like to get their in-kind, uh, their, their staff time reimbursed for that. So that's a negotiation that's we can nice. have. Well, we'd love to have the opportunity to explain, <laughs> to sit with you and talk about, I know. about yeah. our work. So yeah. I look forward to that. Good, good. Can you tell us how many buildings, residential buildings, does Wyndham Windsor Housing Trust own in Bradford, and how many apartment units you have, and how many residents live in Wyndham Windsor Housing in Bradford? In Brattleboro. You know, I can tell you the total, but I'm not sure I know the breakdown for Brattleboro. <coughs> we have over a thousand residents, but that's in communities as far north as Windsor, Springfield, um, Dover, um, you know, Guilford. Um, but I don't know if I, I would guess <coughs> the number of buildings in Brattleboro is around 20, um, and many of those are small, anywhere from three. Uh, geez, the largest one in Brattleboro might be the building that we're, there are 29 apartments in the Daily Shoe Building on Bird Street. Bird Street yeah. um, and then the co-op might be the second largest. There are 24 in the co-op. Mm -hmm. But I would guess it's around 20 buildings in Brattleboro. Many of them in the Clark Canal area. It's really the area where we started doing a lot of our uh, revitalization work. Um, Maybe when you come back through, if you can just I can know the number of buildings and the sure, number of apartments and residents. Sure, and absolutely. For us to know. Sure. Yeah. And are those all um, subsidized housing? Yeah, they, they, are all, um, they are all subsidized. Um, That's your mission, I'm assuming. Is, right. So they all would be, yeah. Right, absolutely. I mean, occasionally, like for instance, in the co-op, we have a few market rate units, and, and in scattered buildings, we'll have a few market rate units, but the vast majority are, are considered subsidized. Yeah. And then do you track the um, income of the, um, the residents to see if, if they continue to qualify? We do. And I think from time to time, there's been misunderstandings about the um, property taxes that the uh, uh, land that the housing trust pays, but I did speak with the assessor today, so it's my understanding that uh, you pay uh, real estate taxes based upon an income approach to the properties based upon the HUD set rental value for those properties? Exactly. Right. And it was a negotiated formula, the League and City of Towns and the, you know, appraiser board. I mean, it, it, this was negotiated quite a number of years ago, but it is, it's an income approach to to um, to establishing value, um, right? Anybody have any question about that? Or we all got that? <laughs> no, not yet. All right. <laughs> we'll we'll, we'll, we'll but, cover that. Yeah. <laughs> right. um, well, I guess as we go forward, uh, the board might be interested in having this. Uh, application follow a model where administrative costs are being covered. Okay. So I can't say that for sure because there wasn't a vote about that, but uh, I certainly you think that <laughs> we'd like to yeah. at least have that considered. So when you're putting together the application for final consideration, why don't you at least think about okay. that and uh, if that's okay. Okay. Absolutely. Okay. So there's no, we, we have no motion or nothing tonight. No, I don't know if the, if the Patrick or the, the grants manager have anything that they'd like to add about this at this point or anything that you think we need to know about this one? No, I think uh, at this point in time, if it, and it, it seems as if the board is supportive, we'll work with Wyndham and Windsor Housing Trust, we'll prepare an application and, um, you know, my direction to the, to the finance department has been to work with uh, uh, Wyndham and Windsor Housing Trust and to go ahead and include our expenses for reimbursement. So um, I think that would be the model that we would propose to bring back. Um, and we can act fast 
these folks are very professional and very good at what they do. And so uh, we'll be back in short order. I, I just have one quick question. If it's one question. No, 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 it's a quick one. I, do you try to hire locally as, as much as possible, or is that? Hire the construction? Yeah, when, you, when you're going out to, or yeah. is it just? Uh, no, well, we go out to bid, and we look for a certain size contractor because, you know, sort of the pickup truck is too small, and then the right. others are too big, and we're sort of aiming for that. And, and so they come from a radius, I would say. Right. Um, there's, there's a project in Putney right now where McMillan from Keene right. is doing it. Mm -hmm. um, but the subcontractors are often very local. I mm -hmm. mean, every, you know, the electricians and right. the plumbers and the... But the GCs, you know, because they're so few, oh, yeah. right. um, they tend to be a radius and they tend to bid from a, a lot of Vermont, whether Rutland or... A lot of, but we, we have, you know, we have uh, two Keene firms on board right now and we've had uh, a Marlboro, New Hampshire Keene firm in the past here. Um, and um, which I know we often don't think are local, but it's sort of in the construction environment, they are kind of local firms for us. So, yeah. One of the things that the um, that came up in the process of the, the police fire um, developments was a conversation about how to how to have make sure that local contractors and local employees are hired. And when companies like that come, wherever they go, the town say we'd like you to hire our people, but they've already got people that they're bringing with them. So what we came up with was that the project manager was going to would become the the locust of that information from the contractors, and he would. When there were openings, he would send them to like Vermont Works for Women, which is running training programs for women to be carpenters, and uh, the, the Voc Rehab and the Labor Department and a number of other organizations that, that are training workers. And um, so that any new employees that were hired by the general contractor or the subcontractors, we want, we want them to be from Brattleboro. Yeah. And rather than put that onus on the employers, the project manager would refer, refer people to them. Yeah. So you might want to consider yeah. uh, looking into that I, I will say that um, you all are graciously sponsoring our, our rehab loan fund grant, mm. block grant, and that program is all local contractors. And we actually sometimes struggle. People seem busy yeah. right now. Yeah. And we've been trying. We, I, I know, spent a long time trying to find someone to put in a kitchen. These are these are renovations to in, homeowners in Brattleboro, but we those are all local contractors. And I, you know, if people are interested, we'd love for them to call us and and tell us, and we'll, you know, let them know when there's work. Great. And we love our local firm. I, mean, I love being able to walk down the street to talk with our local guys. So whenever we can get them on board, it's a real asset for our for our community, but also for our projects. Mm -hmm. We find. So. Was there anybody in attendance who wanted to speak to this project, or to this uh, uh, issue? Anybody else from the board? Well, thank you very much for coming. We'll look forward to seeing the application. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next matter on the agenda is the FY16 budget. Um, I think what we'll do is I'm just going to start by providing a brief overview of what I've seen in the budget-related materials that have been handed out and what appears to be some of the more significant issues that we're going to be dealing with over the course of the budget discussions um, this year. And then I think what we'll do is we'll try to hear from Patrick and from various board members and then from anybody else who's in attendance to um, start getting our uh, selves down the road towards um, getting a budget in place by the beginning of January uh, for inclusion on the town meeting warning. Um, we asked about a month or a month and a half ago for a number of different uh, budget pictures uh, from the administration, uh, essentially budget that would be level service, level funded, um, and uh, the level funded budget included questions 
as to both um, level whether it was going to be level funded with or without contributions from the uh, surplus, uh, which we tapped into last year to try to keep the tax rate down. Um, and um, the budget that's been presented back to us uh, for consideration tonight um, provides, as I understand from the memos, although I don't really see it um, exactly in the budget documents, for about a one cent tax increase um, from last year's budget to this year's budget. And we'll want to talk through how we reach those figures um, going forward. But there are uh, uh, some way important issues that I think need to be highlighted as we begin the discussion of this year's mm -hmm. budget. First of all, there is a very, very major change that's contemplated from last year to this year in terms of how we're paying for solid waste disposal. Uh, in years past, we have paid for solid waste disposal completely out of municipal funds here in Brattleboro. And the budget item is about a million and a little bit more. Patrick, about how much? A million and what? Um, it, it, it varies. It's going down in this year to approximately 950000 All right. But it, it's a fairly significant number. About a million dollars for uh, uh, solid waste disposal. Now, we pay for the solid waste disposal. Um, there are essentially three primary parts of that that we're paying for. We pay for the tipping fee, which is the cost to dump the garbage at the uh, dump. Um, <laughs> um, second is the contract for the trucks to haul the garbage away, including the recycling and the compost. And then third, um, the money that we pay to the Solid Waste Management District, the Wyndham Solid Waste Management District. And the total for next year is contemplated to be about $950,000. Because of the pay-as-you-throw law that's been adopted by the Vermont legislature, as of the beginning of the coming fiscal year, we need to have a system in place where people are paying proportionately uh, to have their garbage taken away. Not so much the recycling of the compost, but the garbage, either by weight or by volume. And so... The entirety of the solid waste budget is being taken out of the operating budget and a separate fund is being established. And this, this coming balance. year's budget contemplates <clears throat> that we will be raising $450,000 next year from the sale of garbage bags, um, $451,145. Um, now, that's an expense that's gonna be borne out of people's pockets. So everybody who wants to throw their garbage away who lives in Brattleboro is gonna have to buy bags, either $2 or $3 bags in order to throw your garbage away. You won't have to pay separately for your recycling or your compost to be taken away, but every household is going to have to buy these bags in order to have garbage taken away. And what that means is that every week households are going to be incurring an additional expense and probably over the course of the year households are going to be paying let's say we average somewhere between $2 and $5 a week in bag costs. That means that the average household is probably going to be spending out of pocket between $100 and $250 a year to throw away your garbage. Now, um, in order for the budget to be totally revenue neutral, 
and impact on your pocket neutral, we would have to cut taxes by that amount of money. Because everybody's going to be paying somewhere between $100 and $250 out of your individual pockets to throw away your garbage, mm -hmm. which is a service that previously had been provided by the town. And the budget that's being presented to us right now, if I understand it correctly, contemplates about a penny increase in the tax rate. But the individual impact of that extra 100 to 250 dollars that everybody's going to be paying to throw their garbage away um, looks kind of like a tax increase. All right? Because you're going to be paying extra money to throw away your garbage, even though if you pay exactly the same taxes, you're not going to be uh, paying more to the municipality. So we need to take that into account mm -hmm. over the course of this budget development cycle. Um, to merely say that we are having a flat tax rate from last year to this year um, would mask the fact that everybody's going to have to pay out of pocket to throw away their garbage next year. Um, and I think what I worked out is that a house that's worth $250,000 that's paying about $150 a year in garbage disposal costs that's essentially like a 5% municipal tax increase. So we need to think about that as we're developing the budget. There are a number of other primary factors that we need to consider as we work through the budget this year. Um, now this totally sets to the side the fact that the police fire infrastructure needs to be dealt with, right? Because we at this point don't have a particular plan in place. And that's an issue we're going to have to deal with. But what we've learned also from the materials that have been provided to us, particularly the capital budget, are that there are some very, very pressing capital equipment needs that we're facing for the coming year. Um, at this point, it's been recommended that we purchase a truck, and I'm saying a pickup truck, or an SUV for the fire department for emergency response, one police cruiser um, that we reduce paving, costs from 300000 to 200000 that we buy a dump truck and a grader. But if I'm reading the capital list, correctly and reading the memos correctly about the uh, current state of that equipment, there's a strong argument to be made that we should really be buying two cruisers this year, not just one. And there would appear to be a strong argument to be made that we should be buying another fire truck this year. That's what I read in the memo. And probably that we shouldn't be cutting back on the paving expenses from three hundred to two two hundred thousand dollars because that's a real quality of life issue in order to maintain our roads. And so we're facing some very, very substantial capital equipment needs that we're going to have to grapple with over the course of this budget cycle. And then we're going to have to also determine how we're going to pay for those. Um, are we going to bond for them? Are we going to borrow commercially for them, which gives us more flexibility? Um, how long are we going to be looking to borrow over what period of time? So what type of payments are we going to be anticipating on any given year going forward? Those are really substantial issues that we're going to have to deal with. Also, um, we got very good news about the health insurance. Um, health insurance costs for the town of Bradover are not going up this year into next year. So that's not one of the increases that we're going to be facing over the course of this budget season. Insurance costs, other insurance costs have gone up just like they do every year, including our workers' comp costs. But we also are going to have to make a decision about the level of wage increases that we include for town employees as we're building this budget, because that's an issue that we're going to have to grapple with. and. It's something that is going to be dealt with as a separate issue we're going to be looking at in the budget. Um, 
over the course of the last year or two, but particularly in the last year, we have struggled to figure out how best to keep the tax rate down. And when the budget was rejected in March, we looked at the potential of service cuts, personnel cuts, and we ultimately decided really not to do that, just to put the police fire project off so that we wouldn't raise taxes more. But it may be necessary to at least consider what service cuts are plausible and possible in order to try to make sure that the average taxpayer in Brattleboro is not hit with a particularly big increase in the expenses they have to pay out of pocket. And I really hate to say it because we mm -hmm. took um, a really strong hit last year when we discussed the possibility, but if we're talking about service cuts, it may be necessary at least to talk about what it would look like to cut discretionary services, whether we need to think about cutting library hours. It, I hate to think about it, but it's something we probably need to consider, whether we need to consider cutting some parks and recs related services, because it really at this point is just not clear to me from whence we're gonna be cutting in the other essential services, mm -hmm. the police, the fire, the public works. And so uh, these are things that we're gonna have to grapple with over the course of this next month or two as we build this budget. But just looking at this as a one cent increase um, is not really a fair picture at this point because of the cost shift that comes from the pay as you throw. And I think we have to acknowledge that at the earliest possible time um, as we start working on this budget going forward. Um, I don't mean to be a downer, but uh, <laughs> I think that I properly <laughs> characterized it. Um, I don't know if anybody else on the board or Patrick would like to speak to it um, at all, but those yeah. are the issues that I see facing uh, us. One of the things that you mentioned, um, which I'd like to <clears throat> elaborate a little bit more on, although I, I, rec I appreciate your setting the expectation level really low, but um, the pay as you throw, um, right now our, our um, garbage fund costs about almost six and a half percent of our entire budget it's a lot of money that's going to be significantly reduced and if you're currently putting out uh, or spending 120 dollars on in your from your tax bill on your garbage you now have will have control over over that money instead of it's just going out and people that put out more are going to pay more people that put out less are going to are going to pay less it's really easy to reduce your gut well unless you got maybe with a lot of diapers it's pretty easy to reduce the amount of trash particularly when you unpack things at the store and let the let the merchants take care of it they'll stop giving you so much garbage to take home but the point is this provides an opportunity for the consumers to limit the amount of money they spend on their garbage by recycling and composting so it's not i mean to paint that as a as a loss to the community, I think is, I, I don't see it that way at all. I think that's just wrong. So I wanted to clarify that. I didn't mean to paint it as a loss just to yep. say that it's going to cost everybody money out of pocket. Yeah, which it currently does. It's just the out of, it's out of pocket on your tax bill instead of out of pocket to buy the bag. But you can't control what's out of pocket on your tax bill. You can control what's in that bag. Which so. is the impetus behind doing this. And yeah, it's exactly. to get us to and recycle why more. the state decided that everybody's got to do it. Right. Right. Anybody else on the board? I'll, I'll Patrick, you go ahead. Yeah, I'll let Patrick. Okay. Um, there's a couple of things I'd like to say about the budget, and there's one point I'd like to make um, about uh, speaking to pay as you throw. Um, it's a, it's a, perhaps a minor point, but I think it's an important one, which is that the transition to pay as you throw or, um, you know, variable rate pricing for solid waste is going to be different for different households. Um, and the reason for that is uh, not every residence in Brattleboro is uh, served by the contract that we have with Triple T, and 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 so neither their um, tipping fees nor uh, is their collection cost 
part of this program. The town maintains a program for uh, single family residences and multifamily residences with uh, four or fewer units. Uh, commercial, industrial, and even commercial residential properties are not served by our contract. So those folks will need to come into compliance, but that will need to be negotiated between themselves and um, their existing carrier, and that won't be a consequence of, of uh, uh, of anything that the town does in terms of transitioning to pay as you throw. So um, it's going to be different depending upon who you are, but I think uh, the comment, the, the point that David was making certainly applies to single family residences and to uh, some of the smaller multifamily residents. Um, in terms of the overall budget and some of the structural differences, um, Certainly, the transition to, to, to uh, pay as you throw is going to have a, a, a significant change. Um, as David pointed out, all of the uh, expenses uh, associated with solid waste, the collection, the tipping fees, the assessment, et cetera, are being uh, placed into a separate fund. Um, I actually brought along some examples of that fund um, that I wouldn't mind passing out because I thought it'd be I thought it'd be kind of useful. Um, why don't I do that? Pass this down. Um, this is just, it, it, it's, it, this is where I got that $950,000 number. That's the expense side. On the revenue side, you can see uh, the transfer that's in the general fund uh, along with the revenue from bag sales. Um, so it, it, it's something to keep in mind, and it is a, a genuine. Uh, structural difference between fiscal 15 and 16. There are others, though, um, and uh, you know, as David pointed out, um, the transition to pay as you throw should have offered us some measure of tax relief. Um, one of the reasons why that isn't as uh, present or obvious as, as you would ordinarily think is that uh, a sum of $510,540 worth of fund balance was used in fiscal 15. So that's a combination of the uh, uh, 200000 that was voted at, uh, at town meeting to help uh, keep taxes from being increased and uh, the funds left over from the project at the skating rink were also used uh, and transferred into the general fund. So um, I think that the benefit that the taxpayers would see from uh, pay as you throw would likely be there um, were it not for the previous year, we, we started off with a good deal of uh, fund balance. And then uh, lastly, with respect to the capital, there certainly is, as David pointed out, uh, there are good reasons to spend more on capital than the 835000 which is being, which I recommended. Um, this, you know, we have a great many number of capital needs in this town. Um, but this was an attempt to try and keep our spending more or less in line with the average for the last five years. And the way in which we were able to uh, structure a budget that uh, kept the tax increase as close to level as possible was by proposing uh, paying for this $835,000 in capital over five years. Uh, the first year being paid in cash, the remaining four um, uh, with, a, with a bank note. Um, it is certainly an option. There are others. Um, and not all the numbers that are here in the general fund are firm. There are certainly uh, um, expenses that continue to get firmed up on a day-to-day -day basis and will over the course of the budget development process. Um, um, but this is where we stand, and I have nothing further to say at this point. You're looking my way, so I will. I will speak, John. How's our uh, unassigned reserve fund looking? It's very healthy. How how healthy? <laughs> oh, here we as go. healthy as it was last year. Oh, well, I think it's healthier. I, I don't remember the exact figure, John, but it's somewhere just a little over two million dollars. That's my recollection. a good good figure right there. Okay, so um, to me. Um, I think pay as you throw is going to take care of itself. I think it's going to, it's going to be an easy transition. Um, uh, I do agree with David that it is a little bit of a transfer, but I also agree with David's goals that uh, the more you recycle, the better off you're going to be. To me, the giant elephant in this room still is the police fire project. 
Um, I, I think um, we have got to get serious quickly about this um, because I, I still, and I called David the other day to express it, that I don't know how we're going to do a budget unless we know um, what is actually going on with that. Um, so um, whether it whether it happens or not, I, I, I obviously want it to happen, um, but I, I think we really need to know what direction um, we're going in in relationship to that. I, and I don't know how the other board members feel, but to me, that's that's the big to me that's the big elephant, and uh, I think we really got to figure out how we're going to do this. So I don't know if Kate. <laughs> I'm looking I, no, I mean, my concern, just like it was, like, when did we do this? A couple months ago, it feels like, um, is the increase in the, in the property taxes. And I think that that's still something that is important to people. I totally agree with John. I don't know how we deal with police fire. It's obviously, if we take out a bond, it's going to increase the bottom line. Um, I do agree with David that we have to be honest with people about about the, you know, what it's going to cost them to do pay as you throw and not pretend that it's not a part of the, you know, the bottom line for what they may be paying. Um, so, I mean, I don't have any, obviously, we don't have any answers tonight because we need to look it over, but, um, you know, I think we're, we're basically where we were again a year ago, um, having to be really, really careful on what we do um, to figure this out. Um, and I don't know what the answers are, but we need to be thoughtful. I don't know, and we've, we've always been thoughtful, but I think we need to continue to be thoughtful. And, you know, I don't want to say this, I don't want anyone to go crazy when I say this, but, you know, we have a short period, we have a short window of time to figure out police fire, if we're going to figure it out. And I don't know if that's necessarily, you know, do we want to rush something or do we want to do something thoughtfully? So that's just another thing to put out there on how we proceed forward with that. I think for me, my, my approach to budgeting is much like my approach to life, which is I like to start broad, and I like to start with um, the memory of several of us being holed up in a room in January <laughs> for an entire afternoon so with it snowing outside and Jan having just repaired the furnace <laughs> and realizing that the task at hand was sobering, but that we had a lot of really keen minds that were tackling this sort of unruly beast of a project. And I think there's a sweet spot between understanding the needs of the town and attending to um, the process. And I think we have department heads that were willing to come forward and say, this is what we can do without. This would really hurt the town. It's a safety issue. Um, it's an emergency response issue. And I think those conversations need to precede any line item work that we tackle together mm -hmm. as we go forward. I actually think that we could come to a decision as a community about how to proceed with a police fire facility. I think we have been laboring that for long enough that the decision <coughs> is going to practically make itself. I think we need to set a time and a space to really finalize that, and the budget is going to force us to do that. Um, but I want to approach this, this project um, with a sense of possibility and curiosity. And I want us to, as crazy as it sounds, enjoy each other's company and be honest and not, you know, have a <laughs> scarcity mentality. We each have the things that I think we safeguard, um, whether that's the tax rate or, um, you know, sort of looking out for those people in our community who risk their lives to, you know, put out fires and deal with um, danger. And so I think we're going to find our way. Um, I don't think it has to be, I don't think we need to make it more difficult than it is. There's a set amount of money we have, and there are things that have to happen. Um, and I think we're a reasonable community. I want to also invite, you know, people like to give select board members input. They like to 
talk to us about things that matter to them. This is a really good time, given what we went through last year, that if you're somebody who's fairly brilliant and can see <laughs> possibilities that maybe those of us who are sitting up here doing our best can't see, I would invite that in my inbox. You know, I think that um, it's better to be proactive rather than reactive, especially around this. Uh, we each have the, the task of sort of dealing with our own finances. We know what it's like to set up a household, to run that well, to keep it warm, to keep it plowed. You know, we know the things that we have to let go of, you know, the Bermuda vacations or, you know, hey. sporty car. Sorry. Um, so I think we all have some innate skills, and we have years of practice doing it. So I think we need to apply that best thinking to this process. So I'd like to start broad and then move in. Donna, you can write my speech anytime. <laughs> Thanks, John. Um, it's, it's, a, it's not actually surprising, although I'm a little, I, I, I was a little surprised at how quickly we turned from the budget in front of us to the the elephant in the room. Thanks, John, for getting us right on it. Yeah, it's, I'm looking think, at the I'm looking at the elephant doors out there. So yeah, I don't think there's any reason, Kate, to be concerned about us rushing to to judgment or rushing to proposal on this. It's been going on for a long time. There's a lot of thought that has gone into it. The committee is even has a subcommittee now. It's it's working to to be even more thorough and, and faster with the process. And I, and I agree with Donna completely that it's going to come. It's going to. This form is going to emerge. We're going to bring it to the town meeting, and the committee is going to make a decision. And um, I think that's that's exactly where it should be. We've had a lot of time to consider. The community's had a lot of time to talk about it, and um, the community has had a lot of time to talk about it. And the committee has done an amazing amount of work, and then gone back and done more work, and then gone back and done even more work in consultation with the chiefs to get the, a proposal that meets their needs and is as inexpensive as possible. And um, so I think that's going to that's going to go its own way, mm -hmm. but it's going to show up on our budget. Anybody else on the board want to speak to this at this point? In terms of process, um, historically we've uh, set a meeting to focus specifically on budget um, mornings or weekend. Uh, to begin the work, and um, I guess the one thing I'd like to see that I don't yet have in this package um, is, um, and I don't know if all other board members feel that way, but um, I think that we need at least to begin contemplating what uh, service cuts in various areas would look like um, in an effort to determine if we're going to um, deal with them. Now, putting that list of service, potential service cuts together um, can't be a particularly big project because we did it, did it twice in the <laughs> last, <laughs> you know, four months. I mean, just recently we did a lot of it. Um, but uh, I think that we at least need to uh, bring back up and ask uh, 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 interim town manager and department heads to at least make a, a list of various things that we could consider uh, for potential cuts uh, because uh, they need to be considered as part of this process going forward. And uh, there's not a lot of that in what I uh, reviewed. So um, I just want to make sure that it's something that's on the table for when we meet for the first time. And I don't know if there's any specific direction that we want to uh, give. Uh, to the administration at this point. Uh, that would be useful. Well, I mean, can we review? Can you go back and review some of the things that were proposed last time and see if they're still? A, I mean, I know, I know they weren't. Nobody wanted to do them then, and I'm not necessarily saying we want to do them now. But are they, as John said, are they still viable options for the departments that came up with them? Essentially, in the range of you know one or two percent worth of cuts to look at and for the board to consider. And it may be broad uh, uh, cuts in any given department, or it may be individual things. Uh, but I think we at least need to have those at our disposal to be considering as we work on the budget going forward. I also think it's it's important to have those become public quickly so that people can let us know what they think about the proposed cuts. Mm -hmm. which are, um, 
they sure they will. Oh, they let us know. <laughs> they let us know last year. That's why we. Yeah. That's why we didn't do any of them. Yeah. Um, David, would it be, and I don't know if this is, you know, to ask the Chiefs that while they're here right now, to, if they have any input, or is that out of, I, we out wanna, of line? I, we definitely want to uh, see if there's anything uh, uh, before the discussion closes up. Okay. Um, I just want to make sure the board's happy. Right. Is there anything else that the board wants to see before we set the first working meeting, uh, besides having now set this tenor? Okay. Well, we've got a good template from what we had last year. Mm -hmm. So, and I, I agree with Donna. Let's start broad and, mm -hmm. and go ahead. Sorry. Okay. When is the? I'm just going to go back to police fire for a second. When is the police fire committee going to come back to us? We're meeting this Thursday. Mm -hmm. yeah. I would, ex I would expect the select board, right? that they're meeting Thursday. Mm -hmm. They're going to need minimally two meetings before they come back okay. to the select board. Okay. So, not not forever away, but because okay. that's pe that's just a piece of this, right? I would think it's a big piece. Yeah, I, I just would think December is probably reasonable. Okay. Well, I was hoping before then, but that's okay. We've only got, well, I know we only got the one meeting. I know we only got one. This one in yep. November, and then I was hoping we'd have something by then. Well, there is an argument to be made that. Planning for the police fire and planning for the other capital equipment needs and planning for the operating budget requires an overview of all three together and looking at all three together from a long term perspective. And uh, our ability as a community to pay for those expenses, I think, uh, arguably. Uh, calls for looking at all those things, and we do have a new town manager coming in um, in the middle of January. And um, while we will continue working in earnest and good faith throughout the process and, and working towards developing numbers, um, part of um, grappling with that long-term uh, obligation issue and the long-term need for investment in infrastructure both equipment and uh, uh, property uh, will also require working with him when he comes in. And I'm not sure that the entirety of the picture is going to become clear before he gets here. And so he's going to be involved in that process as well. <laughs> he's going to be, so I think that he's that's, going to be uh, inundated. We have to recognize that this is a, 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 a long-term project that requires long-term grappling with our ability to pay and our long-term needs that uh, He's going to be participating in discussions about as well. I also want to say too, and Donna, I agree with you on that. That it's it's not all doom and gloom. I mean, it's it's you know we make it sound like it's, but it's we'll get through this. You know, it's any department heads have anything that they want to add right at this minute in time. Um, I think what I would uh, like to do is to ask for a um, list of cuts that would um, total up in the 1% or 2% range, um, looking over what we went through in the last cycles, um, and then probably have us get together with department heads to go through each of the budgets sometime in the next two or three weeks. Does that make sense? So we'll plan on scheduling that meeting after we see an initial run at um, uh, some counterbalancing things that might get built into the We're going to be seeing a lot of each other in the next couple of months. We've seen yeah. a lot of each other over the course of the last well, this year. past month was really weird. And that I know. I've it's only been two days, weeks, man. <laughs> we improved, yeah, it's all really? we improved seems like four sets of minutes, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Three of them in five days. Um, is there any other comments or questions or anything to talk about the budget right now? Anybody? All right. Um, we'll end the uh, uh, next item on the agenda is to read the calendar, I think. That's great. Um, just real quickly, just and, and I, I just thought it. of it. No, okay. do did we give Patrick enough? You know, to 
to start. Yep. We did. Okay. Yep. I just wanted to make sure. Not a problem. Okay. Yep. Who wants to volunteer to read the calendar? Slowly. Oh. I did it last time. I know. I, I did it time as well. But. My dog chewed my <laughs> I'll read it. I'll read it. I'll read the calendar. Oh, yeah. Look at we're losing them. This is you want to do a chunk of it? I'll do it. All right. Uh, you know, because you look at we're, we're losing everybody. Wednesday, November 5th. 5 p.m., page to throw committee, select board meeting room. 6 p.m., ad hoc futures committee, Hannah Cosman room. Thursday, November 6th, 4 p.m., Police Fire Facilities, Building Committee, Hannah Cosman Room. Saturday, November 8th, 10 a.m., Human Services Review Committee. Monday, November 10th, 6 p.m., Parks and Recs Board meeting, Gibson Aiken Center. Tuesday, November 11th, 8.30 a.m., Town Offices Closed for Veterans Day. 4 p.m., Arts Committee, to be determined. 7 p.m. Tree Advisory Committee, Hannah Cosman Room. Friday, November 14th, 10 a.m., ADA Advisory Committee, Marlboro College Graduate Center. Monday, November 17th, 5.15 p.m., West River Park Meeting, Gibson Aiken Conference Room. 5.30 p.m., Human Services Review Committee, 528 Good Enough Road. That's a odd spot. 7 p.m., Development Review Board, Select Board Meeting Room, and I think there's another page. Oh, yes. 615, Select Board Meeting, Select Board Room, 6.30 p.m., Basic Meeting, Gibson Aiken Conference Room. I want to thank everybody for going out and voting. Uh, I bet the polls are closed by now since it must be after 7 o'clock. I want to thank members of the press. Uh, ASL interpreters, everybody who's been watching our meeting, we're ready for a motion to adjourn. So moved. We have a motion to adjourn. Uh, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 We oppose or abstain. That carries 5-0. Thanks, everybody. Honey, put out the checkers.